you know, after that, I feel like I can hardly speak. Thank you guys for leading us so well. But from the sublime to the trivial, and then we'll go back to sublime, okay? I have friends, you, many of you know, Kelly works in a ministry with medical and dental students. And a couple of three years ago, one of those medical students uh, was invited by a fellow student uh, up to his grandfather's farm. It was opening weekend of deer season. And uh, this one particular medical student, he didn't know anything about hunting. They'd been hunting for in his life. His friend invited him, so he went along just for the fun. And so they got to the place, got up early the next morning, handed his friend a barred rifle, and he went out and he just sat on a stump. And wouldn't you know it, before long, the muy grande of the whole woods showed up right in front of him. He just sitting there on the stump. He raised up the barred rifle and shot the deer. And then his other friend, you know, who was the hunter, came and said, I can't believe what you did. This is the really big deer. And the guy, you know, was just a deer to him. And it was in the sentiment, you don't even, you don't even respect this deer. You don't deserve this deer. And haven't all of us felt like that sometime? We see somebody else receiving a gift, we go, you don't even know how big a deal this is. I told you it was going to be trivial, didn't I? Well, there was another friend who went fishing for the very first time. It wasn't me. It was another guy. His name was Robbie Ray. He was a college student at Texas Tech University. And he took a semester off school to go work in Canada in collegiate ministry up there. And so my friend took him fishing. Same thing happened. Handed him a rod and reel. Told him where to sit in the boat. And said, we're going to go fishing. So Robbie casted this barred reel. And wouldn't you know... He hooked into a big old gigantic 22-pound northern pike. And it's like, you don't deserve this fish. I have worked for fish like this all my life, and a lot of people have never even caught one like it. And my friend Bill, who had taken him, said, that made me so mad. <laughs> but we all have a version of that in us, don't we? We see what looks to us like injustice. We see someone else receiving a gift that they didn't earn. And we're going, hey, what about me? I've been working all this time. I've been fishing all these years. I've been hunting all these decades. What about me? And so, you know, we all have a little bit of a version in this. This message was spawned by a comment that Billy made last week. She's, you know, last week's message, does anybody remember besides me? It was why do bad things happen to good people. And Billy said, you should do one on why do good things happen to bad people. And I said, you got it. I'll work on that. And so that's what we're working on today. Why do good things happen to bad people? And let me just say real quickly, you know, I'm open to your suggestions. And, uh, you know, one of the most difficult parts about this role is coming up with a plan. You know, what, what's going to be next Sunday? And so if any of you has a suggestion that you'd like to make, if I like it, I'll work on it. <laughs> But do, make suggestions to me. You can do those in writing. You can send email to the church or just tell me after church. And uh, I will consider it, okay? How about that? So we did. We, uh, we worked on that message this week because each of us has a version of that in our lives. We, we see ourselves as being so noble and doing so much good stuff. And then sometimes we feel like our rewards are meager. But we see other people who aren't working nearly hard as we are. And that they're getting these big blessings. We're going, hey, what about me? Well, you know what? There's a whole psalm in the Bible about that very thing. And so we're going to look, that, look at that in just a minute. And so this morning, I'm actually going to stay pretty close to my notes. And I want you to do so with me, okay? We have put in print this week's psalm. This is the whole chapter of the Bible that deals with that very Thing. And so we're going to read this together here in a few minutes, and then we're going to be a little bit redundant. We're going to go kind of down through it point by point, because you know what? I don't think that uh, you're the only one in the room who has ever felt that. And so we're going to read from a man who even put that in print. Do it. You know, this was not a theme that got by Jesus either. He shared not one, but two parables about this very same thought. And so you remember one of them. We looked at it for a number of weeks, actually, here some months ago, perhaps, in Luke 15. Remember the parable of the prodigal son. And a parable means a hypothetical. This is a story that really didn't happen, but it's fiction. 
but we also have a lot to learn from that. That's what a parable is. Well, one of the parables was, remember the older brother? Remember he's the one who stayed home working hard all the time? And when he was coming in from the field, he heard the party. And he called one of the other servants and said, what in the deal is going on? He said, your younger brother has come home and your dad's thrown a party for him. And remember how he felt? What about me? He saw what he thought was injustice. You mean that son who squandered your resources and you're throwing a party for him? Totally undeserved. And that was kind of the point, wasn't it, that Jesus made? Another time, Jesus told a parable. This one is in Matthew chapter 20. And it's a parable about the workers in the vineyard. And remember, a man had a harvest that he needed help with. And so he went out early in the morning, it says. Jesus talking, you remember this hypothetical, this parable. He went out and hired a crew. And they got to work early. Well, he could tell that, hey, we're, we don't have enough workers. I need more. And so he hired another bunch of guys at 9 o'clock in the morning. After the others had already been working. And then, as the day progressed, he realized... We're still not going to get it done today. He went out and hired more guys at noon. Did the same thing at three. And at five o'clock, he hired another bunch of guys. And they all came to work. Well, at the end of the day, they did get the harvest done. And, you know, the, the uh, owner of the field called all the guys together. And he said, okay, we're going to pay them. The last ones that got here, you, go, you come up first and we'll pay you. And what he paid them? A denarius. You know what that means? A day's wage. They didn't show up to 5 o'clock. And they got a whole day's pay. And so the other guys are going, wow, this is going to be good. They got paid that much by only showing up at 5 o'clock. Imagine what I'm going to get. But then the 3 o'clock crowd, they got paid the same. And the noon crowd, they got paid the same. And by this time, the guys who got there at 9, the guys who got there earlier, well, they're all mad. Because they knew that they had worked harder than the rest of these guys. And in fact, they did. They got paid the same. And so they were complaining at what looked to them like an injustice. Those guys who didn't deserve it got that gift. And I deserve so much more. And I got the same as them. You know, it's jealousy, isn't it? It's what that is. Well, that's the way that this man was feeling today that he read this psalm. And I've, uh, I've done this on purpose. We're going to use two different translations this morning. Just a brief word about translations. You know what? Anybody who speaks two languages or three or however many, you know that there's any number of ways that you can say a thing translating from one language to the other. And that's why we have these numerous different translations of the Bible. Not because they're in a contest to see who can get it right. Because there are lots of ways to get it right. You know, you're translating from three different languages in which the Bible was written, you know, centuries ago. And so to translate meaning takes in a whole lot more than just words. It also takes into account the, uh, the way the words are used in any given day. And even in our lifetime, there are folks of us in this room who we've seen the meaning of words change over time. I'll give you one example. Gay. It means something different than it used to mean, doesn't it? Coke. It means something different than it used to mean. Well, that's also one of the reasons why we have so many different translations of the Bible. Not only because language changes, but because there are any number of ways that you can accurately translate from one language to another. We're using two translations this morning. The one that we have printed out for you is, uh, is the King James Version. No, it's not. It's actually not. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I, I, I changed my, my mind throughout the week. The mind's a terrible thing to lose. And so, you have, you have this in King James. That's the translation that we're going to use when we go kind of down through it line by line by line. So, keep that in your lap and keep that ready. But, I'm going to read it to you in the message translation. A man named Eugene Peterson, a number of years ago, he did a lot of his ministry with children. And so he was well aware that the language that, mo that is used in most of the Bible translations weren't necessarily what kids would understand. And so he himself, a scholar in the biblical languages, made a, yet another translation, called it the message. It's not a paraphrase. There are paraphrases, and they have their place as well. 
But this is actually a translation by Eugene Peterson. I'm going to read it to you in one of these translations. And his point was just to make it readable. Not necessarily, he says in his introduction, this is not a study Bible. This is a Bible just to read. And so I'm just going to read this to you. It's not what you have in your lap. It's different, okay? Fair warned. And uh, then we will go to a different translation. We'll go through verse by verse. Here's what Asaph, who is uh, one of the music leaders, Pete, in the first century church. Oh, no, it would have been before that. It was the Old Testament. In, in the, uh, he, he worked in the tabernacle or in the temple. And uh, he actually wrote 12 different psalms. David asked him to do so, King David. And so this is one of those 12 that Asaph wrote. Probably would have been put to music. Probably in the original language. Because of the meter, maybe even some rhyming, it would have sounded more like a poem. But that is lost in translation, but not the meaning. So I'm going to read this kind of quickly and just listen. Listen to the story take place. This was Asaph. He had observed the same thing you and I have. He saw what looked to him like injustices. And so he wrote this. No doubt about it, God is good. Good to good people, good to the good hearted. But I nearly missed it, missed seeing his goodness. I was looking the other way, looking up to the people. At the top, envying the wicked who have made it, who have nothing to worry about, not a care in the world. Pretentious with arrogance. They wear the latest fashions in violence. Pampered and overfed. Decked out in silk bows of silliness. They jeer using words that kill. They bully their way with words. They're full of hot air. Loud mouths disturbing the peace. People actually listen to them. Can you believe it? Like thirsty puppies lapping up their words. What's going on here? Is God out to lunch? Nobody's tending the store. The wicked get by with everything. They've made it. Piling up riches. I've been stupid to play by the rules. What has it gotten me? A long run of bad luck. That's why a slap in the face every time I walk out the door. If I'd have given in and talked like this, I would have betrayed your dear children. Kind of makes a turn like me. Still, when I tried to figure it out, all I got was a splitting headache. Until... I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I saw the whole picture. The slippery road you put them on with the final crash in a ditch of delusions. And the blink of an eye. Disaster. A blind curve in the dark. And a nightmare. We wake up and rub our eyes. Nothing. There's nothing to them. And there never was. When I was beleaguered and bitter. Totally consumed by envy. I was totally ignorant, a dumb ox in your presence. I'm still in your presence, but you've taken my hand. You wisely and tenderly lead me, and then you bless me. You're all I want in heaven. You're all I want on earth. When my skin sags and my bones get brittle, God is rock firm and faithful. Look. Those who left you are falling apart. Deserters, they'll never be heard from again. But I'm in the very presence of God. Oh, how refreshing it is. I've made the Lord God my home. God, I'm telling the world what you do. Had you ever heard it like that before? Yeah, that's why Eugene Peterson went to the troubles. A lot of trouble to do that. To translate the Bible in yet another uh, translation. And so let's, uh, let's look through that uh, story together. And this time, like I said, I'm going to stick pretty closely to my notes. And I want you to do the same. That's why we printed this out. You can mark on it and, and uh, maybe underline some things. But I've also included in this that's in print in your laps. The outline that I will follow. And so uh, we're going to start with this at the beginning and the psalmist looked up and we'll follow these three points that are made in your outline there as well okay the psalmist 
looked around with distress, and that's where he started. Read that. Look at, look at your translation there that you have in your lap. As Asaph looked around and reflected on life, he became deeply disturbed. Man, it bothered him. It chapped him to see people who he thought were not living as good a life as him, but yet they were still getting rewards. So look what he says there. And really, we have to give him credit for being so honest. How many of us have thought those things, but we just keep our mouth shut and kind of stew on the inside? But he wrote this down. And that's why we're reading it today. Look what he says. Look at the people he was observed, and it made him angry. It made him, it made him jealous. He said, look in verse 3, they're wealthy. How many of us have seen that? We see people that we, you know, they're not going to church on Sundays, and maybe use foul language, and engage in other things that we wouldn't approve of. And yet it seems to be going pretty well for them. They're wealthy. I saw the prosperity of the wicked, he said. And he said they're healthy. Verse 4, their strength is firm. Their body's strong and healthy. Again thinking, this is not right. This is unjust. One more word he used to describe them. Who he saw as not being deserving of God's blessing. Untroubled. Verse 5. How do they seem to have such peace? You know, if I were living his life, I'd be, you know, fretting. I'd be worried that God was going to get me. It says it this way in verse 5. They are not in trouble as other men. Man. Well, thank goodness he didn't stop there. You know, he looked around and it distressed him. But at least he keeps going. The psalmist looked within. Still not going to make a good turn yet. But again, I think many of us relate to this. He was a faithful Jew. He was trying to obey the laws. He was trying to keep his hands clean before God. But the neighbors that he saw that weren't doing any of those things were seemingly in better shape than him physically, even materially. And he was thinking, what should I do with this? Is my theology all wrong? He started questioning his understanding of God. Look at verse 13. Asaph says, uh, you know, that he seems like he has a clean heart and what he's doing must be vanity. I'm wasting my time. I'm going to all this work for nothing. And so when he looked within, he thought, man, why am I even going to so much trouble? A few years ago, Remember a conversation took place right over there beside the wall. And many of you remember Ross Behrman. Great guy. Spoke great Spanish. Had a big old heart for uh, the folks who lived over in Acuna. And I think Ross probably spent a fortune crossing the bridge. Because he, was, he would find something at a garage sale and he'd buy it. And guess what he'd do with it? He'd head across the river. Find somebody to give it away to. And so Ross was, you know... All of us who observe, this is a great man doing good stuff. But Ross seemed to be stuck. And, and he just, you know, he, he couldn't make a living, it seemed, doing what he loved to do. And so he was taking side jobs. He was, oh my goodness, he was substitute teaching. Can you imagine? That would be a death sentence for me. And, and he, told, he told me, standing right over, he said, Robert, I don't know what, what's going on. I pinned and repented, is the way he said it. And he was looking inside and feeling the same way. I don't know why I'm not getting the blessings. It seemed like other people, and I was one of those other people. You know. But he didn't hold it against me. He was looking inside. Well, that's what Asaph did here. Look in verse 15. He realized... This examination of his theology better put on halt because of this. If I falter and give up on God, I may mislead and offend others. Thinking mostly about the younger generation. For if for no other reason Asaph said, I'm still going to keep on. Just because I don't want to be a poor example. How many of us have done that? For our kids. I'm going to keep on and try to do the right thing because Dan and Chris are watching. And I may not even have my heart in it anymore. But out of care for them. And that's what Asaph said. 
Let me say one thing in passing. Um, uh, you know, if, if our following God, trusting Him with our lives, is dependent mostly on just following the example of other people, that's really not a very secure place to be. Because people will always disappoint. We will. We will all of us will falter. And, and I will. And so, as we look up to others, it's great to have great role models. But let's don't attribute to them only that which God is faithful with. You know, the reason we follow him is him. It's not just because of the good example. This room's full of them, of other people. Because when they falter then, then we reconsider our commitment to God. So just kind of in passing. But then finally, he looked up. Isn't that good? Asaph looked up. And it says in my outline and on your page, with delight. So let's keep on going. Finally, he went to church. And he kind of had a time of self-examination. Verse 17 says, I went to the sanctuary of God. Then I understood. God showed him the horror which lies ahead for the wicked. The disobedient and the unbelievable. And in fact, he uses these words, look, in verse 18, destruction. Verse 19, desolation. Verse 19 again, consumed in terrors. In verse 21, he expresses grief that he had charged God with injustice. He's, he, he admitted, he said, my attitude was so foolish, I was almost animal-like. The words he used, as a beast. And he confessed that to God. Verse 23 comes the welcome word. Nevertheless. Means he turned the corner. You know, God had talked him off the ledge. See, that's using metaphors, modern day language, that they wouldn't have had in the first century, or centuries before that when this was written. Verse 23, he comes to the conclusion that God is just and fair after all. And that God had really been good to him. You see that. Verse 23 and 24, those two verses, use three tenses. In the present, I'm continually with the first part of verse 23. And he goes to the past, the last part of verse 23. And there's the King James translation. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. You never let go. The way we would put it. In the, in the past. And in the future. Future tense. There it is in King James verse 24. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. And afterward receive me to glory. Past. Present. Future. God's got this. It's not up to me to judge the people around me. That they feel like that they're getting rewards that I have earned. And I'm not getting the reward. And they certainly didn't. It's not up to us that we can trust God with all of this. Verse 25. And this is a, a verse that you've probably heard before. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there's no one upon earth that I desire beside thee that was his conclusion in verse 26 God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever so there you go you know Asaph felt the same things that we have from time to time he put them to print we can see step one step two step three he looked around made him mad he looked within even more so disappointed in himself but then finally, he looked up. So Billy, this is a very thing that uh, Asaph dealt with, and God thought enough of it that he even put it in the Bible. <clears throat> I came up with a modern-day illustration of this very same thing. Those of us who are old enough remember Manuel Noriega. He was the... The dictator started out just as a military man, then became the dictator of, remember the country? Panama. 
And why is the United States so interested in that? Panama Canal. And so we do. We keep a real close relationship with the Panamanians. And uh, for a while, Manuel Noriega was their chief informant. And he would let them know who's doing what that's bad. And the United States would intervene. And, and, uh, but then he ended up selling cocaine. And uh, trafficking those drugs. And so they overlooked it at it for a while because he was still a benefit to them but finally they said enough is enough so they indicted him in Florida and then they actually invaded and they captured him and took him as a prisoner took him back to Florida and so he was arrested and you know there are probably some people in Panama during the drug lord dictator days they're going why has God given that guy all of that stuff Look how bad he is. Look what he's doing. You know, why didn't God trust me with something like that? And imagine the day that he arrested, they said, yes. He finally got his due. And he's in prison. Well, they did. They tried him and they sentenced him to 40 years in prison. But guess what happened while he was in prison? Well, there's a man. I have his name here. Um, his name was Clifton Brannan. And uh, Manuel Noriega called him Dr. Clift because one day he, he was in prison ministry. He was a prison chaplain. And so he had a conversation with Manuel Noriega and he asked him that question. Do you know that Jesus loves you? To Manuel Noriega. When Manuel Noriega responded to the gospel, and on the day that he was baptized, it was on October 24th, 1992, he shared his testimony. Manuel Noriega shared his testimony. And this is what he said, translated to English. Speaking of Jesus, he's the Son of God, who died on the cross for our sins, who rose from the grave and is at the right hand of the Father, and who above all things is my Savior and has mercy on me a sinner what a good things happen to bad people because it's the nature of God and Manuel Noriega knew that well let's conclude like this okay um, if this is the first day that you've it's ever occurred to you that a man like Manuel Noriega could be forgiven by God this may be your day how many times I've talked to college students they said well you know you don't know the things that I've done you know what doesn't matter you know because God's grace is bigger than all of that stuff why does bad things happen to good people why do good things happen to bad people I got it mixed up didn't I because we're all bad people and we all need God's grace. Let's close by praying. Lord, thank you that we can even see in the example of a man who uh, really went through an evil part of his life and you never stopped pursuing him. So Lord, if you care about Manuel Noriega, it helps us know that you also care about us. So Lord, help us keep on responding. Help us welcome you into our lives and help us let you be our Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.